Now we're going to look at the Churchill crocodile. I know we've looked at the Churchill before, but today we're really concentrating on the crocodile, the flame throwing part, and therefore we're going to talk more about the trailer than the tank, which I suppose is okay in the end. Ordinarily speaking, a tank shouldn't pull a trailer. It causes nothing but trouble. But with this, they had no alternative. They didn't want the crew inside the vehicle with the fuel in case the whole thing blew up in one go. They wanted the fuel carried in a trailer and that's one of the reasons it was chosen. Now the trailer itself weighs about six tons. It has no springs at all. It relies entirely on the big tires to cushion its drive and it's got no brakes either. Now that's okay behind the tank. The tank's as solid as you like and you've only got to shove the brakes on it'll stop. But these things were designed to be towed by a lorry over long distances and that was quite hard work. Actually towing one of these things uncontrolled in a way behind you wasn't very really nice but they, the drivers got used to it in the end knew how to do it. Let's look at it from the outside. You can see that it's got a lot of clobber on top of it. The rods along the side, there's one on the other side as well, they're really handling bars. You push them into these orifices at the side and you can handle the thing independently of the tank. It takes about four or five men to do it but you need that to keep it balanced. It's got legs to stand on if it needs them, they're presently on the opposite side and they're just to hold it level when it's not attached to the vehicle. On top of it there's a tow bar and that you normally fit if you're going to have it towed by a lorry. You clip that onto the front, onto the, the uh, the towing part and that hitches onto the back of a truck and that's how they move them over long distances. It's got other stowage as well for canvas and for pioneer tools but they're not necessary now and they're hard to get. I can tell you. Um, the armour is the same as on the tank, it's fairly thick and it had to be because the the great thing was they wanted a trailer that would stand up to um, being shot at. Only small arms fire, anything bigger like another tank should get it and the thing went up in flames at once. But I'll explain that in a moment. The, um, the trailer is towed by the tank. It delivers the fuel under pressure. They used um, cylinders of nitrogen to give them the, the gas pressure. You've got two tanks in the back which I'll show you in a minute. And that is all pumped through, it goes through the trailer, through the join, underneath the tank and up under the gunner's, the flame gunner's seat. It's not the best arrangement in the world, but at least it keeps it fairly safe because it does mean the poor old uh, flame gunner's getting dripped with petrol all the time. But they didn't use ordinary fuel in these things. They found if they fired ordinary petrol, it gave a fantastic flame and a fantastic cloud of smoke, but it didn't really have any serious effect. So what they actually used was a form of thickened fuel, which had a, a sort of stickiness in it. Therefore, if you squirted it, you could A, squirt long hard jets of it um, at a target, and it would stick to whatever it um, met. So it meant that the fire kept on going for a little while which they thought was jolly handy. It meant it was very difficult. One of the things with the flame throwing tanks was that the infantry had to be trained to go in straight after the flame and, and go into action. If they didn't then you've got um, a gap when the enemy can recover their senses and put up more resistance anyway. So the idea was to have the infantry trained to work with the flamethrower. That didn't always happen. The, um, in Normandy, they had three regiments of these things. The first was 141st RAC, which had been converted from the Buffs, and that landed on D-Day and was the first of the Crocodile regiments. It was followed a little while later by 1st, 5th and 4th for Yeomanry, who um, again learned how to handle the vehicles because the original plan was to convert these vehicles in a limited number and make them available to all Churchill regiments. But they found it was better to operate them as flaming regiments in their own right. The third one, which didn't actually mobilise until well, 1945, was 7th Royal Tanks. And 7th was actually the old 10th that had been remade into 7th because the original 7th had disappeared. 
and um, that came in in 1945. So you had actually three regiments of these things that didn't mean to say they all worked together or anything like that. They, in fact, they hardly ever operated as a regiment. They usually used a few flamethrowers scattered about with other units, but always under the control of 79th Armoured Division. Once the 79th had taken over the flamethrowers, they used to send a representative along to work with the um, commanding officer who was commanding whatever action they were involved in, and he would recall the crocodiles as soon as they would prove their worth. As soon as they'd done their stuff, they were recalled the 79th Armoured Division. They weren't allowed to stay with the regiment indefinitely, otherwise they'd be misused. So that was again part of the, the whole structure of the flamethrowing unit. Quite a specialised unit. They were um, used originally to take out strong points, which they were meant to do on D-Day, but they found they were jolly handy at clearing woods and that sort of thing as well. They even tried flame as a means of exploding mines by squirting the flame over the minefield, but th that didn't really work terribly well. Now we're looking at the back of the trailer to show you where the fuel and the nitrogen go, which is the propellant. There used to be, or there should be a door here, but it fell off ages ago and uh, nobody knows where it is now, so we can't show you the door. It fitted on down there and it covered the whole area. But um, inside you've got two large tanks. They're both painted yellow to make them stand out. And these hold 200 gallons each of the flame fuel. So you've got 400 gallons in here. That's quite a lot, but you'd be amazed how quickly it's used. The flamethrower is designed to fire the flame in half second bursts. That's about all it would do. And in, even in those cases, it used to um, get through the flame or the fuel particularly quickly. The other problem was pressure. You've got five nitrogen bottles in here. Each one of them is squirting propellant into the pipe that carries the fuel. So in other words, that's how the flame is fired out of the flamethrower. And what they found was that if they got the thing all ready to go into action, turned these things on as they'd have to before they went into action, they often found that if they left it for any length of time, the pressure dropped until there wasn't enough to squirt the fuel out. You just got a trickle coming at the end, which wasn't the idea at all. So um, you found that they wouldn't activate the nitrogen cylinders until the thing was nearly ready to go into action. And then you'd probably get about half an hour's use out of it, after which the pressure had gone down and it was useless. And so that's what they're for. And they're actually hidden, or at least you can just see the ends of them, but they're hidden between the two main tanks. But the fuel itself, as I said earlier, it's a, a thickened fuel. They could squirt the liquid from the flamethrower. This was called a wet strike. And you fired the liquid at it and then set fire to it later. And that really burned like a house, well, it was a house on fire when it uh, went the right way. But that's how this thing works. The driver of the tank has always got to be aware that he's got a trailer on the back. He's going to know that anyway when he goes anywhere because it's going to tug him back a little bit. But he was enjoined, as much as anything else, to manoeuvre the tank in such a way that he protected the trailer as much as possible from enemy fire. Which sounds pretty daunting if you don't, you can't really see the trailer. You're driving on instinct, really. But that's what they were supposed to do. Now, what is outstanding in the crocodile arrangement is this what they called the link which actually connects the tank to the trailer now a Churchill Mark 7 which is the only type used was invariably fitted with the connecting parts already on it when it left the factory even if it wasn't going to be a crocodile it was prepared to take the trailer if need be and that was all part of the arrangement. It didn't happen with all of them, but most of the later ones were already prepared for it. So you have this thing which is actually, it serves two purposes. For a start, it's acting as a universal joint between the tank and the trailer. So no matter what the tank does, which way it turns, that will follow it and make sure that the trailer doesn't get um, 
tangled up, but also the trailer's acting as a conduit for the fuel, the flame fuel, and the propellant, which are all coming through here and then being taken into a pipe that goes under the tank into which the flame is delivered, the fuel is delivered. So it's serving the two purposes, and it is really one of the most vital parts of the whole setup. It's incredibly strong. Now they say, I've never actually seen these, but they say that the trailer was fitted with a pair of micro switches, and when they wanted to, they'd illuminate the um, red and green light in front of the driver, telling him he was about on limit as far as turning against the trailer was concerned because if you went too far you ended up damaging the trailer and because they, they didn't want to do that so the the micro switch was done to to prevent that he had to keep an eye on these lights and if one came on then he knew he'd turned as, as far as he could turn really that was at least the idea so that's how the trailer is towed by the tank and why the trailer had to be protected by the tank it's always behind it, but of course, at times it's going to go off at one angle or another. And at times like that, the tank needs to turn in such a way that it covers the existence of the, the trailer as well. So not really to hide it. There's no point with flame belching out everywhere. You knew what it was. But um, to make it a little bit more impervious to enemy shot. And that's why it was done. So it's an unusual arrangement, this linkage. Much stronger than you'd think and full of universal joints so that it will go every which way. The tank can go over an obstacle and the trailer should follow. But uh, whether it always did is another matter. But it's in quite independent of the ordinary tow hook, which is down here, which is used for towing a trailer, if the tank ever had one, or a sledge, which they did now and again. Um, it is a, an independent effort by itself up here. Now we've come around to the front really to look at the flame projector. On the Churchill Crocodile, the flame projector is actually the wasp. It's exactly the same as the, the flamethrower used in the small carriers. And that was quite a late decision. Originally they were going to use a different form of flamethrower and make it, in a sense, coaxial with the hull machine gun. And that they planned to do to begin with until I think it was a chap called John Rackham who worked for AEC, who came up with this idea of installing the WASP instead, and the WASP actually replaced the hull machine gun completely. All they've done, though, is bolted on a hood, an armoured hood over it. The trough that the flamethrower fits in is exactly the same one as you'd use for the machine gun, but instead it's got the flamethrower fitted in it, and that's operated from inside by the flame operator. And that's really how the flame gun part of the thing works. The flame belts out of here and comes out with quite a, a force. It got a range of about a hundred yards and um, that's quite dramatic really when you think it's all of burning flame and as a psychological thing flame is a terrible weapon. If you keep out of its way you're perfectly safe it won't hurt you, you can go quite close to it but the sight of it and the idea of being burned was almost too much for people. So you only had to demonstrate this, and nine times out of 10, you get a surrender of a fortified house, anything else, because people didn't like the idea of being burned. Now, as I said, we had in North Northwest Europe, three regiments of these in a brigade, all part of the 79th Armored Division. And the crocodile was probably one of the most lethal bits of kit the 79th Armoured Division had. We know they went out to India, but they weren't really planned to use them in, didn't plan to use them in Burma. They had visions of the trailer being a flaming nuisance in amongst the trees, so they preferred a Sherman-based flamethrower, which had an integral fuel tank and the flame usually in the gun itself. But otherwise, it was, it was still a flamethrower, it's just not quite as potent as this thing was but they didn't like the idea of using the trailer there. They were used in Italy to some extent by 25th Armoured Engineer Brigade, but they were really most famous for the, their actions in Northwest Europe.